This reading is a production of Stillwater's Revival Books. Stillwater's Revival Books is online at www.puritandownloads.com. Holiness Demanded A sermon published on Thursday, September 22, 1904 and delivered by Charles Spurgeon at the Metropolitan Tabernacle in Newington, England on Lord's Day evening, 1862. Holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Hebrews 12, 14. One feels most happy when blowing the trumpet of jubilee, proclaiming peace to broken hearts, freedom to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. But God's watchman has another trumpet, which he must sometimes blow. For thus saith the Lord unto him, Blow the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Times there are when we must ring the taxon. Men must be startled from their sleep. They must be roused up to inquire, What are we? Where are we? Whither are we going? Nor is it altogether amiss for the wisest virgins to look to the oil in their vessels, and for the soundest Christians to be sometimes constrained to examine the foundations of their hope, to trace back their evidences to the beginning, and make an impartial survey of their state before God. Partly for this reason, but with a further view to the awakening and stirring up of those who are destitute of all holiness, I have selected for our topic holiness, without which... No man shall see the Lord. There's been a desperate attempt made by certain antinomians to get rid of the injunction which the Holy Spirit here means to enforce. They have said that this is the imputed holiness of Christ. Do they not know, when they so speak, that by an open perversion they utter that which is false? I do not suppose that any man in his senses can apply that interpretation to the context, follow peace with all men and holiness. Now the holiness meant is evidently one that can be followed, like peace, and it must be transparent to any ingenuous man that it is something which is the act and duty of the person who follows it. We are to follow peace. This is practical peace, not the peace made for us, but the, the fruit of righteousness, which is sown in peace of them that make peace. We are to follow holiness. Well, this must be practical holiness, the opposite of impurity. As it is written, God has not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. The holiness of Christ is not a thing to follow. I mean, if we look at it imputatively, that we have at once, it is given to us the moment we believe. Righteousness of Christ is not to be followed. It is bestowed upon the soul in the instant when it lays hold of Christ Jesus. That's another kind of holiness. It is, in fact, as everyone who can see, who chooses to read the connection, practical, vital holiness, which is the purport of this admonition. It is conformity to the will of God, obedience to the Lord's command. It is, in fine, the Spirit's work in the soul by which a man is made like God and becomes a partaker of the divine nature, being delivered from the corruption which is in the world through lust. No straining, no hacking at that text can alter it. There it stands, whether men like it or not. There are some who, for special reasons, best known to themselves, do not like it, just as no thieves ever like policemen or jails. Yet there it stands, and it means no other than what it says, without holiness. Practical, personal, active, vital holiness. No man shall see the Lord. Dealing with this solemn assertion, fearfully exclusive as it is, shutting out as it does so many professors 
from all communion with God on earth and all employment of Christ in heaven, I shall endeavor first to give some marks and signs whereby a man may know whether he hath this holiness or not. Secondly, to give sundry reasons by way of improvement of the solemn fact Without holiness no man shall see the Lord. And then thirdly, to plead hard in Christ's stead with those who are lovers of gain, that they may bethink themselves ere time be over and opportunity past. First then, brethren, you're anxious to know whether you have holiness or not. Now, if our text said that without perfection of holiness, no man could have any communion with Christ. It, it would shut every one of us out. For no one who knows his own heart ever pretends to be perfectly conformed to God's will. It does not say perfection of holiness, Mark, but holiness. This holiness is a thing of growth. It may be in the soul as the grain of mustard seed and yet not developed. It may be in the heart as a wish and a desire rather than anything that has been fully realized. A groaning, a panting, a longing, a striving. As the Spirit of God waters it, it will grow till the mustard seed shall become a tree. Holiness in a regenerate heart is but an infant. It is not matured. Perfect it is in all its parts but not perfect in its development. Hence, when we find many imperfections and many failings in ourselves, we are not to conclude that, therefore, we have no interest in the grace of God. This would be altogether contrary to the meaning of the text, as it is not so much my present purpose to show what this holiness is as what it is not. I think while I am endeavoring to undeceive those who have not this holiness, those who are not condemned may reasonably draw some comfortable inferences as to their own pursuit of this inestimable grace. Well now, let's note four sorts of people who try to get on without holiness. First, there's the Pharisee. The Pharisee goes to work with outward ceremonies. He pays tithes of all that he possesses his anise, his mint, his cumin, everything. Even to the tithe of his parsley bed, he gives. He gives alms to the poor. He wears his phylacteries and makes broad the borders of his garment. In fact, anything and everything that is commanded ceremonially, he most punctiliously attends to. But all the while, he's devouring widows' houses. He's living in the practice of secret sin. And he thinks that by ceremonies he shall be able to propitiate God and be accepted. Sinner, Pharisaic sinner, hear the death knell of thy hopes told out by this verse without holiness. That is a thing thou knowest nothing of. No man shall see the Lord. Thy ceremonies are vain and frivolous, even if God ordained them. Seeing thou puttest thy trust in them, they shall utterly deceive and fail thee, for they do not constitute even a part of holiness. Thou canst not see God till thy heart be changed, till thy nature be renewed, till thine actions in the tenor of them shall become such as God would have them to be. Mere ceremonialists think they can get on without holiness. Fell delusion. Do I speak to any ritualist who finds himself awkwardly situated here? Do I speak to any Romanist who has entered into a place where not the works of the law, but the righteousness of Christ is preached? Let me remind you again very solemnly, my listener, that those Fine hopes of yours, built upon the maneuvers of the priests and upon your own performances, shall utterly fail you in that day when most you shall need them. Your soul shall then stand in shivering nakedness when most you need to be well equipped before the eyes of God. 
These men know not true holiness. Then there is the moralist. Why, he's done nothing ever wrong in his life. He's not very observant of ceremonies, it's true. Perhaps he even despises them. But he treats his neighbor with integrity. He believes that uh, so far as his ledger being examined, uh, as far as he knows, it, it bears no evidence of a single dishonest deed. As touching the law, he is blameless. No one ever doubted the purity of his manner. From his youth up, his carriage has been amiable, his temperament what everyone could desire, and the whole tenor of his life is such that we may hold him up as an example of moral propriety. Ah, but this is not holiness before God. Holiness excludes immorality, but morality does not amount to holiness. For morality may be but the cleaning of the outside of the cup and the platter, while the heart may be full of wickedness. Holiness deals with the thoughts and intents, the purposes, the aims, the objects, the motives of men. Morality does but skim the surface. Holiness goes into the very caverns of the great deep. Holiness requires that the heart shall be set on God and that it shall beat with love to him. The moral man may be complete in his morality without that. Methinks I might draw such a parallel as this. Morality is a sweet, fair corpse, well washed and robed and even embalmed with spices, but holiness is the living man as fair and as lovely as the other, but having life. Morality lies there of the earth, earthy, soon to be food for corruption and worms. Holiness waits and pants with heavenly aspirations, prepared to mount and dwell in immortality beyond the stars. These twain are of opposite nature. The one belongs to this world, the other belongs to that world beyond the skies. It is not said in heaven, moral, moral, moral art thou, O God, but holy, holy, holy art thou, O Lord. You note the difference between the two words at once. The one, how icy cold. The other, oh, how animated. Such is mere morality and such is holiness. Moralist, I know I speak to many such. Remember that your best morality will not save you. You must have more than this. For without holiness, and that not of yourself, it must be given you of the Spirit of God. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Another individual who thinks to get on without holiness and who does win a fair reputation in certain circles is the experimentalist. You must be aware that there are some professed followers of Christ whose whole religious life is inward. To tell you the truth, there's no life at all, but their own profession is that it is all inward. I've had the misery to be acquainted with one or two such. Uh, they are voluble talkers, discoursing with much satisfaction of themselves, but bitter critics of all who differ from them in the slightest degree, having an uh, ordained standard as to the proper length to which Christian experience should go, cutting off everybody's head who was taller than they were and stretching every man out by the neck who happened to be a little too short. <laughs> I've known some of these persons. If a minister should say duty in the sermon, they would look as if they, they could never hear him again. Why, he must be a dead legalist, a, a letter man, I think they call him. Or if they're exhorted to holiness, why they tell you they are perfect in Christ Jesus and therefore there is no reason why they should have any thought of perfection in the work of the Spirit within. Groaning, grunting, quarreling, denouncing, not following peace with all men, but stirring up strife against all. This is the practice of their religion. This is the summit to which they climb and from which they look down with undisguised contempt upon all those worms beneath who are striving to serve God and to do good in their day and generation. Now I pray you to remember that against such men as these there are many passages of Scripture most distinctly leveled. I think 
This is one among many others. Sirs, you may say what you will about what you dream you have felt. You may, you may write what you please about what you fancy you have experienced. But if your own outward life be unjust, unholy, ungenerous, and unloving, you shall find no credit among us as to your being in Christ. But without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. The moment you know a man who is drunk on a Saturday night and then enjoys so-and-so's preaching on a Sunday, the moment you know a man who can tell you what a child of God should be and then appears himself exactly what he should not be, just quit his company and let him go to his own place. And, And where that is, Judas can tell you. Oh, beware of such high flyers with their waxen wings mounting up to the very sun. How great shall be their fall when he that searches all hearts shall open the book and say, I was hungry, you gave me no meat. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. Inasmuch as you did it not to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it not to me. There is another class of persons, happily fewer than they once were, but there are some among us still, opinionists, who think they can do without holiness. These too, it has sometimes been my misfortune to know, and they've learned a sound creed, or perhaps an unsound one, for there are as many Arminians as Calvinists in this line. Uh, They think they have got hold of the truth, that they are the men, and that when they die, the faithful will fail from among men. Uh, They understand theology very accurately. They're wiser than their teachers. They can a hair divide betwixt the west and northwest side. And there's no question about their being masters in divinity. If degrees went according to merit, they would have been dubbed D.D. years ago, for they know everything and are not a little proud that they do. And yet these men live a life that is a stench, even in the nostrils of men who make no profession of religion. We have some of this kind in all congregations. I wish you would not come here. If we could do you good, we might be glad to see you, but you do so much hurt to the rest and bring so much discredit upon the cause at large that your room would be better than your company. You listen to the sermon and sometimes perhaps even have the condescension to speak well of the preacher who wishes you would not. Yet after the sermon is done, on the road home, there may be a public house door just opened at one o'clock, and the brother refreshes himself, and perhaps does so many times. Even if it be the holy day, it is all the same. Yet he's a dear and precious child of God. No doubt he is in his own estimation anyway. And then during the week, he lives as others live, and acts as others act. And yet congratulates himself that he knows the truth and understands the doctrines of the gospel and therefore he will surely be saved. Out with thee, man. Out with thee. Down with thy hopes. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. No big words of ready talkers, no mere doctrines will suffice. Broken hearts and humble walkers, these are dear in Jesus' eyes. Heart work carried out afterwards into life work. That is what the Lord wants. You may perish as well with true doctrines as with false. If you pervert the true doctrines into licentiousness, you may go to hell by the cross as surely as you may by the theater or by the vilest of sin. You may perish with the name of Jesus on your lips and with a sound creed sealed on your very bosom, for except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. Now, if any of you belong to either of these four classes, I think you cannot help knowing it. Being destitute of gospel holiness, you have good cause to bewail your character and tremble or your destiny. But to help you still further, brethren, that man is destitute of true holiness who can look back upon his own past 
his own past sin without sorrow. Oh, to think of our past lives. There were some of us who knew the Lord at, at 15 years of age, but those 15 years of unregeneracy, we can never forget them. Others may say we did not know him till we were 50 or 60. Ah, oh, my dear brethren, you have much to weep over. But so have those of us who knew the Lord in early life. I can look back upon God's mercy with delight. But I hope I shall never be able to look back upon my sins with complacency. Whenever a man looks to any of his past faults and shortcomings, it ought to be through his tears. Some men recall their past lives and talk of their old sins and seem to roll them under the tongue as a sweet morsel. They live their lives over again. As it was said of Alexander, he fought his battles o'er again and twice he slew the slain. There are those who revel in the memory of their iniquities. They live their life in imagination over again. They recollect some deed of lewdness or some act of infamy, and, and as they think it over, they dare not repeat it, for their profession would be spoiled. But they love the thought and cultivate it with a vicious zest. Thou art no true friend of holiness, but a, an utter stranger to it unless the past causes thee profound sorrow and sends thee to thy knees to weep and hope that thy God, for Christ's sake, has blotted it out. And I am quite sure that you know nothing of true holiness if you can look forward to any future indulgence of sensual appetites with a certain degree of delightful anticipation. Have I a man here, a professed Christian, who has formed some design in his mind to indulge the flesh and to enjoy forbidden dainties when an opportunity occurs. Ah, sir, if thou canst think of those things that may come in thy way without tremor, I suspect thee. I would thou wouldst suspect thyself. Since the day that some of us knew Christ, we have always woke up in the morning with a fear, lest we should that day disown our master. And there is one fear which sometimes haunts me, and I must confess it. Were it not for faith in God, it would be too much for me. I cannot read the life of David without some painful emotions. All the time he was a young man, his life was pure before God. And in the light of the living, it shone with a glorious luster. But when gray hairs began to be scattered on his head, the man after God's heart sinned. I have sometimes felt inclined to pray that my life may come to a speedy end, lest haply in some evil hour some temptation should come upon me and I should fall. Do you not feel the same? Can you look forward to the future without any fear? Does not the thought ever cross your mind, he that thinketh he standeth may yet fall? The very possibility of such a thing. Does it not drive you to God's mercy seat? And do you not cry, Hold thou me up, and I shall be safe? There is no doxology in Scripture which I enjoy more than that one at the end of the epistle of Jude. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to him be glory. I say to you, you are a stranger to holiness of heart, if you can look forward to a future fall without great alarm. Again, methinks you have great cause for questioning unless your holiness is uniform. I mean, if your life is angelic abroad and devilish at home, you must suspect that it is at home and that you are what you really are. I question whether any man is much better than he is thought to be by his wife and family, for they, after all, see the most of us, and they know the truth about us. And if, sir, though you seem in the pulpit or on the platform or in the shop to be amiable, Christian, and godlike to the passers-by, your children should have to mark your unkindness, your want of fatherly affection for their souls, and your wife has to complain of your domineering, of the absence of everything that is Christ-like, 
well, you may shrewdly suspect that there's something wrong in the state of your heart. Oh, sirs, true holiness is a thing that will keep by night and by day, at home and abroad, on the land and on the sea. That man is not right with God who would not do the same in the dark that he would do in the light, who does not feel if every eye should look upon me, I would not be different from what I am when no eye gazes upon me. That which keeps me right is not the judgment and opinions of men, but the eye of the omnipresent and the heart of the Lord who loves me. Is your obedience uniform? Some farmers I know in the country maintain a a creditable profession in the village where they live. They go to a place of worship. They seem to be very good people, but there is a farmer's dinner once a year. It's only once a year. And we will not say anything about how they get home. Uh, the less that is said, the better for their reputation. It's only once a year, they tell us, but holiness does not allow a, of dissipation even once a year. And we know some who... But when they go on the continent, for instance, say, well, we need not be quite so exact there. And therefore the Sabbath is utterly disregarded and the sanctities of daily life neglected. So reckless are they in their recreations. Well, sirs, if your religion is not warranted to keep in any climate, it's good for nothing. I like the remark which I heard from one of the sailors on board ship in crossing the Irish Channel. A passenger said to try him, wouldn't you like to attend a certain place of amusement, which he mentioned? Well, sir, said the sailor, I go there as often as ever I like. I have a religion that lets me go as often as I think proper. Oh, how is that, he inquired. Because I never like to go at all, was the reply. I don't keep away because of any law, for it is no trial to me, but I should be unhappy to go there. Surely the fish, were it asked if it did not wish to fly, would reply, I'm not unhappy because I'm not allowed to fly. It's not my element. So the Christian can say, I'm not unhappy because I don't spend my nights in worldly society, because I do not join in their revelry and wantonness. It's not my element. I could not enjoy it. Should you drag me into it, it would be a martyrdom, which to my spirit would be alike repulsive and, and painful. You're a stranger to holiness if your heart does not feel that it revolts at the thought of sin. And then let me further remark that those who can look with delight or any degree of pleasure upon the sins of others are not holy. We know of some who will not themselves perpetrate an unseemly jest. Yet if another does so, and, and there is a laugh excited upon some not over-decent remark, they laugh and thus give sanction to the impropriety. If there is a, a low song sung in their hearing, which others applaud, though they cannot quite go the length of joining in the plaudits, still they secretly enjoy it. They betray a sort of gratification that they cannot disguise. They confess to a gusto that admires the wit. Well, it cannot endorse the sentiment. They're glad the minister was not there. They're glad to think the deacon did not happen to see them just at that moment. And yet still, if there could be a law established to make the thing pretty respectable, they would not mind. Some of you know people who fall into this snare. There are professing Christians who go where you at one time could not go. But seeing that they do it, you go too. And there you see others engaged in sin and it becomes respectable because, because you give it countenance. There are many things in this world that would be execrated if it were not that Christian men go to them. And the ungodly men say, well... If it is not righteous, there's not much harm in it after all. Um, it is innocent enough if we keep within bounds. Mind, 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 professor. If thine heart begins to suck in the sweets of another man's sin, it is unsound in the sight of God. Thou canst even wink at another man's lust. Depend upon it, 
that thou wilt soon shut thine eye on thine own, for we are always more severe with other men than we are with ourselves. There must be an absence of the vital principle of godliness when we can become partakers of other men's sins by applauding or joining with them in the approval of them. Let us examine ourselves scrupulously then, whether we be among those who have no evidences of that holiness without which no man can see God. But, beloved, we hope better things of you and things which accompany salvation. If you and I, as in the sight of God, feel that we would be holy if we could, that there is not a sin we wish to spare, that we would be like Jesus, oh, that we could, that we would sooner suffer affliction than ever run into sin and displease our God. If our heart be really right in God's statutes, then despite all the imperfections we bemoan, we have holiness wherein we may rejoice. And we pray to our gracious God, finish then thy new creation, pure and spotless let us be. Now then for the second point, briefly. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. That is to say, no man can have communion with God in this life and no man can have enjoyment with God in the life to come without holiness. Can two walk together, except they be agreed? If thou goest with Belial, dost thou think that Christ will go with thee? Will Christ be a pot companion for thee? Dost thou expect to take the Lord of love and mercy with thee to the haunts of sin? Professor, dost thou think the just and holy one will stand at thy counter to be co-traitor with thee in thy tricks? What thinkest thou, O man, Wouldst thou make Christ a sharer of thy guilt? And yet he would be so if he had fellowship with thee in it. Nay, if thou wilt go on in acts of unrighteousness and unholiness, Christ parts company with thee, or rather, thou never didst have any fellowship with him. Thou hast gone out from us because thou art not of us. For if thou hadst been of us, doubtless thou wouldst to have continued with us. And as to heaven, dost thou think to go there with thine unholiness? God smote an angel down from heaven for sin. Will he let man in with sin in his right hand? God would sooner extinguish heaven than see sin despoil it. It is enough for him to bear with thine hypocrisies on earth. Shall he have them flung in his own face in heaven? What? Shall an unholy life utter its licentiousness in the golden streets? Shall there be sin in that higher and better paradise? No, no. God has sworn by his holiness, and he will not, he cannot lie, that those who are not holy, whom his spirit has not renewed, who have not been by the regenerating power of the Holy Spirit made to love that which is good and hate that which is evil shall never stand in the congregation of the righteous. Sinner, it is a settled matter with God that no man shall see him without holiness. I come to my last point, which is pleading with you. Doubtless there are some in this vast crowd who have some sort of longings after salvation and after heaven. My eye looks around. Yes, sometimes it has been my want to gaze with sorrow upon some few here whose cases I know. Ah, do I not remember one? He, he's been very often impressed, and so impressed too, that he's not been able to sleep. Night after night he's prayed, he's wrestled with God, and, and there is only one thing in his way. And that is drink, strong drink. By the time that Wednesday or Thursday comes round, he begins to forget what he heard on Sunday. Sometimes he has taken the pledge and kept it three months. But the craving has been too strong for him. And then he's given all resolutions and vows up and has plunged into his besetting sin worse than before. 
Others I know in whom it is another sin. You are here now, are you? You do not come of a morning, and yet when you come at night, you feel it, you feel it very severely. But why did not you come here in the morning? Because your shop is open, and that shop seems to stand between you and any hope of salvation. There are others who say, well, now, if I go to hear that man, I must give up the vice that disquiets my conscience, but I, I cannot yet, I cannot yet. And you are willing to be damned for the sake of some paltry joy? Well, if you will be damned, it should not be for want of reasoning with you and weeping over you. Let me put it to you. Do you say that you cannot give up the sin because of the profit? Profit? Profit, forsooth, what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What profit have you obtained hitherto? You've put it all into a bag full of holes. What you have earned one way, you've spent it in another. And you know that if this life were all, you surely have not been any the better for it. Besides, what is profit when compared with your immortal soul? Oh, I adjure you, lose not gold for dross. Lose not substance for shadows. Lose not your immortal soul for the sake of some temporary gain. But it is not profit with some of you. It is pleasure. It's a morbid passion. You feel perhaps for some particular sin which happens to beset you such an intense longing. And in looking back upon it afterwards, you think you could, you could give up everything but that. Young man, is it some secret sin which we must not mention, or is it some private guilt which is hidden from all hearts but thine own? O oh soul, what is this pleasure after all? Weigh it, weigh it. What does it come to? Is it equal to the pain it costs thee now, to the pangs of conscience, to the agonies of remorse? When an American doctor who had led a loose life, came to die, he seemed to wake up from a sort of stupor, and he said, find that word, find that word. What word, they asked. Why, he said, that, that awful word, remorse. He said it again, remorse, and then gathering up his full strength, he, he fairly seemed to shriek it out, remorse, write it, he said, write it. It was written. Write it with large letters and let me gaze at it. Underline it. And now, none of you know the meaning of that word. May you never know it. It has an awful meaning in it. And I feel it now. Remorse. 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 What, I ask, is the pleasure of sin contrasted with the results it brings in this life. And what, I ask, is this pleasure compared with the joys of godliness? Little as you may think I know of the joys of the world, yet so far as I can form a judgment, I can say that I would not take all the joys that earth can ever offer in a hundred years for one half hour of what my soul has known in fellowship with Christ. We who believe in him do have our sorrows, but blessed be God, we do have our joys. And they are such joys, oh, such joys, with such substance in them and such reality and certainty that we could not and would not exchange them for anything except heaven in its fruition. And then, bethink the sinner, what are all these pleasures when compared with the loss of thy soul? Now there's a gentleman high in position in this world with fair lands and a large estate who, when he took me by the buttonhole after a sermon, and he never hears me preach without weeping, said to me, Oh, sir, it does seem such an awful thing that I should be such a fool. And what for, I asked. Why, he said, for the, the sake of that court and of those gaieties of life and of mere honor and dress and fashion. I'm squandering away my soul. I know. I know the truth, but I do not follow it. 
I've been stirred in my heart to do what is right, but I go on just as I've done before. I fear I shall sink back into the same state as before. Oh, what a fool I am, he said, to choose pleasures that only last a little while, and then to be lost forever. Forever, I pleaded hard with him, but I pleaded in vain. There was such intoxication in the gaiety of life that he could not leave it. Alas, alas, if we had to deal with sane men, our preaching would be easy, but sin is a madness, such a madness that when men are bitten by it, they would not be persuaded even though one should rise from the dead. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. But I hear someone say, it's impossible. I, I've tried it and I've broken down. I, I did try to get better, but I, I didn't succeed. It's of no use. It cannot be done. You're right. You're, you're right, my dear friend. And you're wrong. You're right. It's of no use going about it as you did. If you went in your own strength, holiness is a thing you cannot get. It's beyond you. The depth says it is not in me. The height says it is not in me. You can no more make yourself holy than you could create a world. But you're wrong to despair. For Christ can do it. He can do it for you. And he can do it now. Believe on him. And that believing will be the proof that he's working in you. Trust him. And he that has suffered for thy sins, the lion of the tribe of Judah, he shall come in and put to rout the lion of the pit. He will bruise Satan under thy feet shortly. There's no corruption too strong for him to overcome. There's no habit too firm for him to break. He can turn a lion to a lamb and a raven to a dove. Trust him to save thee, and he will do it. Whosoever thou mayest be, and whatsoever thy past life, May have been. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. That is, he shall be saved from his sins and delivered from his evil practices. He shall be made a new man in Christ Jesus by the power of the Spirit received through the medium of his faith. Believe, poor soul, that Christ is able to save thee and he will do it. He will be as good as thy faith and as good as his own word. May he now add his own blessing to the word I have spoken and to the people who have heard it for his own sake. Amen. Stillwater's Revival Books is now located at PuritanDownloads.com. It's your worldwide online Reformation home for the very best in free and discounted classic and contemporary Puritan and Reformed books, MP3s, and videos. For much more information on the Puritans and Reformers, including the best free and discounted classic and contemporary books, MP3s, digital downloads, and videos, please visit Stillwater's Revival Books at PuritanDownloads.com. Stillwater's Revival Books also publishes the Puritan Hard Drive, the most powerful and practical Christian study tool ever produced. All thanks and glory be to the mercy, grace, and love of the Lord Jesus Christ for this remarkable and wonderful new Christian study tool. The Puritan hard drive contains over 12,500 of the best Reformation books, MP3s, and videos ever gathered onto one portable Christian study tool. An extraordinary collection of Puritan, Protestant, Calvinistic, Presbyterian, Covenanter, and Reformed Baptist resources. It's fully upgradable, and it's small enough to fit in your pocket. The Puritan hard drive combines an embedded database containing many millions of records with the most amazing and extraordinary custom Christian search and research software ever created. The Puritan hard drive has been produced to assist you in the fascinating and exhilarating spiritual, intellectual, familial, ecclesiastical, and societal adventure that is living the Christian life. It has been specifically designed so that you might more faithfully know, serve, and love the Lord Jesus Christ, as well as to help you to do all you can to bring glory to His great name. If you want to love God with all your heart, 
soul, strength, and mind, then the Puritan hard drive is for you. Visit PuritanDownloads.com today for much more information on the Puritan hard drive and to take advantage of all the free and discounted Reformation and Puritan books, MP3s, and videos that we offer at Stillwater's Revival Books.